The following training is sponsored by the Niagara Library System. We serve our member libraries in Niagara, Orleans, and Genesee counties. Please visit your local library homepage and use your library card to get access to streaming videos, downloadable music, audiobooks, ebooks, and even more from the comfort of your own home. Thank you. Hello. Good to see everybody. And today I am going to uh, try and talk fast and uh, uh, quickly and I was trying to figure out how I could shorten this up and, and it was quite difficult. So even when I was highlighting, you notice like there's red and stuff on the screen and I was highlighting too much of the, this, there's so much to talk about. And anyway, we started this with uh, confirmation bias. I will uh, try and link that video um, in the description or in a title card or something up here. Uh, humans with confirmation bias, we have a tendency to uh, look at things that confirm what we already think. So um, no real surprise there with anybody who's spent any time with people or on social media. Oh dear, yes, all right. So even worse, uh, I ran into this article by Reed Abergati. You can see here on the screen, let me scroll a little, and uh, artificial intelligence filters our experience on the internet. So not only do we get confirmation bias, but now we get confirmation bias even worse, okay? So um, he talks about uh, a gentleman named Philip Arg, Argra, Agra, A-G-R-E, Agra, I am, butchering that name, I'm sorry, but in 1994, before most Americans had an email address, um, Philip Agra foresaw that computers would one day facilitate the mass collection of data on everything in society. So he was uh, certainly a head, ahead of his time. And he writes here in the blue, genuinely worrisome developments that can seem not so bad simply for lacking the overt horrors of Orwell's dystopia, wrote Agra, who has a doctorate in uh, computer science from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He wrote in an academic paper uh, back in 1994. Uh, genuinely worrisome developments about big data, about the information we give away, so on and so forth. So um, nearly 30 years later, uh, Agra's paper seems eerily prescient, a startling vision of a future which has come to pass in the form of a data industrial complex that knows no borders and very, very few laws. Um, and even the laws that are passed and that um, many People who advocate for privacy and groups that advocate for privacy are seen as being a little bit um, off, let me say that, okay? Uh, I've talked multiple times about privacy and, and things like that in my classes, and I get some strange looks from people. It's, it's okay, but it, it, without the overt horrors of it, we, we just keep trading and trading and trading our privacy. Um, and I do and I do it too, and I do it too. So let me keep going here. There's a ton of stuff. I'm going to link also the original the, uh, article. This is not the entire original article. In the description, it, it's well worth the read. Uh, Charlotte Lee here, who studied under Agra as a graduate at UCLA, uh, is now a professor of human-centered design and engineering at the University of Washington, is said she is still studying his work and learning from it today. Um, she said she wishes he were around to help her understand it even better, but Agra isn't available. In 2009, he simply dropped off the face of the earth, abandoning his position at UCLA. When friends reported Agra missing, police located him and confirmed he was okay, but Agra never returned to the public debate. His closest friends declined to further discuss details of his disappearance, citing respect for Agra's privacy. Wow, okay. So instead, many of the ideas and conclusions that Agra explored in his, in his academic research and his writing are only recently cropping up in think tanks and nonprofits. So he was there 30 years ago. Okay. Uh, I'm seeing things that Phil wrote about in the 90s being said today as though they're new ideas, says Christine Borgman. They're, they're not new ideas. By the early 1990s, and again, I'm skipping through here because there's just so much, I thought, amazing information. 
By the early 1990s, Agra came to believe the field of artificial intelligence had gone astray, that a lack of criticism of the profession was one of the main reasons. In those early days of artificial intelligence, most people in AI were focused on the complex math problems aimed at automating human tasks with limited success. Yet the industry described the code they were writing as intelligent, giving it human attributes that don't actually exist. They were anthropomorphizing their code. Okay? In his landmark 1997 paper called Lesson Learn Lessons Learned in Trying to Reform AI, it is still considered a classic. Um, and Agra noticed that those building artificial intelligence ignored critiques of the technology from any outsiders. Nevertheless, AI has barreled ahead unencumbered, weaving itself even into low-tech industries and affecting the lives of most people who use the internet. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, it guides people on what to watch and read on YouTube and Facebook. It determines sentences for convicted criminals, allows companies to automate and eliminate jobs, and allows authoritarian regimes to monitor citizens with greater efficiency and thwart attempts at democracy. Today's AI, which has largely abandoned the type of work Agra and others were doing in the 80s and 90s, is focused on ingesting massive amounts of data and analyzing it with the world's most powerful computers. But as the new form of AI has progressed, it has created problems rating, ranging from discrimination to filter bubbles to the spread of disinformation. And as I talked about in the cognitive bias, Oh, no, actually, this is an upcoming video. I'm getting my videos mixed up. <laughs> just wait till we get about the spread of disinformation. And it's not just bots. People have a tendency to do it, too. Oh, OK. So in December, Google's firing of AI research science Timnit Gebru after she wrote a paper on the ethical issues facing Google's AI's efforts highlighted the continued tension over the ethics of artificial intelligence and the industry's aversion to criticism. It's such a homogenous field and people in that field don't see that maybe what they're doing could be criticized, said Sophie and Anne Audrey a professor of computational media at the University of Quebec. Let's go back to Phil uh, Agra. Agra wrote that when he entered college, he wasn't required to learn about much else other than math and arrived in graduate school at MIT with little genuine knowledge beyond math and computers. He took a year off graduate school to travel and read, trying in an indiscriminate way and on my own resources to become an educated person. Agra began to rebel, in a sense, from his profession, seeking out critics of artificial intelligence. In other words, he was going against his own confirmation bias. Amazingly smart. He was studying philosophy and other academic disciplines. At first, he found the texts impenetrable, very difficult, he wrote, because he had trained his mind to dissect everything he read as he would a technical paper on math or computer science. It finally occurred to me to stop translating these strange disciplinary languages into technical schemata and instead simply learn on them from their own terms. Absolutely ridiculously smart. For this reason, Agra became a very sought after academic. Several former colleagues told stories about Agra's insatiable appetite on books from across the academic and the popular landscape piled high in his office or in the library. He became known for his original thinking. Also, this goes back to one of the videos I did on Roger Bannister and how Roger Bannister, who was the first person to break um, the four minute mile in running, was also very, very similar in that he was constantly learning, constantly updating his techniques, constantly uh, talking about running and other things, and constantly learning and evolving. I am I'm just amazed at, at all of this. And like I said, you can see all of this. I was trying to just highlight the important stuff. Forget it. <laughs> OK. Um, so, but here, I'm going to skip, let me, let me put this right here at the top of the page, talking about Agra 
In 2001, he wrote that your face is not a barcode. Arguing against the use of facial recognition in public places, in the article, he predicted that if the technology continued to develop in the West, it would eventually be adopted elsewhere, allowing, for instance, the Chinese government to track everyone inside its country within 20 years. And of course, that really has come to pass. 20 years later, a debate ranging in the United States over the use of facial technology by law enforcement and immigration officials, and some states have begun to ban the technology in public places. Despite outcry, it may be too late to cur curtail the proliferation of the technology. In China, as Agra predicted, it has already begun employing it on a mass scale, and you can find out more about that. Interestingly here as well, several years ago, former colleagues at UCLA attempted to put together a collection of his work, but Agra resurfaced, telling them to stop. Uh, so his life work was left uncompleted, questions posed but unanswered. I just, it, it all the things that I, we think are new uh, are not really that new and a ridiculously uh, smart gentleman um, and really incredible. And these are a lot of the issues that we face today. I even talked about a video on coupons and how we trade uh, instead of buying, say we spend money for the Sunday paper for coupons and we get those coupons for free because they, we paid for the paper that they come in. Um, we have to sign up for an account, sign up for an account. And that way you get the coupons that you can print for free. When you sign up with an account, you sign up with an email address, you sign up with a password, and if you choose to go forward with these accounts with things like like a Google, um, excuse me, not an email address, but things like you sign in with, with Facebook or other social media, you give these companies even more and more and more data about ourselves, and we are trading. We are turning into the barcodes, not just our face is not a barcode, we're turning into the barcodes, so <sighs> there'll be more. Okay, so uh, take care, and we'll see you soon. <laughs> Bye now.